Hi again, everybody. Welcome to the 11th lecture for Astronomy 102 on the electromagnetic spectrum. In this lecture, we'll talk about all of the different flavors of light that astronomers capture and measure, and we'll also talk about how astronomers gather that light using telescopes. We'll remind you of many of the terms used to describe light in the last lecture, and we'll teach you a few more that we'll need as we continue through the semester. Before launching into new material, let me first remind you of a very important term that was introduced in the last lecture, and that I'll use throughout this one. That term is wavelength, which is a fundamental property of light. Wavelength is the distance between peaks of a wave. In the ocean, this would be the distance between the crest of one wave and the crest of the next. For light, it is the distance between high points in the electric and magnetic fields that feed off of one another to make light, hence the name electromagnetic. As we'll learn in this lecture, light wavelengths run the gamut from picometers, trillionths of a meter, to hundreds of kilometers. For some kinds of light, namely the kinds of light that we see with our eye, called optical or visible light interchangeably, we perceive wavelength as the color of light. As you learned when we conducted the Herschel experiment in class, though, there's more to light than meets the eye. Humans only perceive a tiny fraction of this vast wavelength range. We're constantly bathed in light that we can't see because it lies outside of the narrow range of wavelengths that the human eye can perceive. Which isn't to say that it exists only in the abstract. Other wavelengths of light outside of the visible have profound implications and detectable effects, not just on astronomical phenomena, but also in our daily life here on Earth. Take this video, for example which shows a man applying sunscreen to his face in visible light on the left and in ultraviolet light on the right. Ultraviolet light is light just like the visible light that you see with your eye, only it has shorter wavelengths and higher energy than visible light. On the left, we can see that the sunscreen appears white in visible light and that it disappears from his face as he rubs it in. The video on the right, though, which is what you would see if your eye perceived UV light instead of visible, shows the sunscreen as black. The sunscreen remains black as he applies it to his face. This is because sunscreen is designed to absorb UV light in order to prevent it from reaching the skin. In this case, the sunscreen is preventing UV light from reflecting off of his face and reaching the camera. UV light is the light that causes sunburn, and the sun gives off a fair amount of it, so this shows us that the sunscreen is fulfilling its intended purpose. Here's another view of an everyday phenomenon in another type of light. This video is of a truck stop. In this case, the camera sees an infrared light, which has slightly longer wavelengths and lower energy than visible light. You can see that warm objects, such as the driver, emit lots of infrared light. When the truck pulls away, a surprising thing is revealed. It has left a dark shadow behind. Think about what this is telling you for a moment before I explain. Why does the infrared shadow remain when the truck moves? The shadow is due to the trucks having blocked light from the sun from reaching the pavement while it was parked there. The pavement is cooler where it was shaded by the truck, and it emits less infrared light, appearing dark in this view. This effect persists even after the truck has moved away, because it will take a few minutes for the pavement to warm back up. Here's an astronomical example with three views of the sun at three different wavelengths, 
the leftmost image is of the sun in visible light. This is how we would see the sun with our naked eye if it were a little closer and it didn't hurt so much to look at it directly. The middle image is the sun as viewed in ultraviolet light, and the rightmost image is of the sun in X-ray light. Aside from a few sunspots, the visible light image doesn't show much. It looks like a pretty dull place. But the UV and X-ray images reveal that there's a lot going on in the sun, and we wouldn't know about it if we only had visible light to go off of. In these high-energy forms of light, we see all kinds of solar activity and loops of material called solar prominences extending from its face. As with most astronomical objects, we can only get a complete picture of what's going on if we observe it at multiple wavelengths. Each one gives us a different part of the full picture. So far we've mentioned a few different types of light but it's worth pausing for a moment to lay them all out relative to one another. This chart shows the full electromagnetic spectrum, or all of the different kinds of light, which remember is also called electromagnetic radiation, hence the electromagnetic spectrum. The first thing to note is that this chart is ordered by wavelength. Starting with the longest and moving towards the shortest wavelength, we go radio, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. Although they sound more exotic, all of these are just different kinds of light, different because of their wavelengths and by extension their frequency and energy. Let's go through them in more detail one by one. Radio waves are very long and we call light with a wide range of long wavelengths radio. Radio light can have wavelengths anywhere from a millimeter to hundreds of kilometers in length. If we write these numbers as powers of 10 in meters, that's 10 to the negative third power all the way to 10 to the fifth power or so. That means radio waves span a range from 10 to the negative three 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 meters long. Each one of these powers of 10 is referred to as an order of magnitude, each one 10 times bigger than the last. We therefore say that radio waves span 8 orders of magnitude. The smallest ones are 10 to the 8th, or a hundred million times smaller than the largest ones. That's quite a range. Infrared light lies between radio light and visible light in the electromagnetic spectrum. It has shorter wavelengths than radio light, but still longer than visible light. Its wavelengths range from 700 nanometers, 700 billionths of a meter, at the shortest, to one millimeter at the longest, where radio wavelengths take over. This range from 700 nanometers to one millimeter is about four orders of magnitude, 10 to the four or 10,000. The shortest infrared wavelengths are 10,000 times shorter than the longest infrared wavelengths. Visible light occupies a comparatively narrow range of wavelengths, just about 400 to 700 nanometers, not even a full order of magnitude. In fact, just about 30% of one. The shortest visible wavelengths are just 30% shorter than the longest. As you learned in the last lecture, wavelengths around the 400 nanometer end, the shortest of the visible, correspond to the colors purple and blue, and wavelengths around the 700 nanometer end of the spectrum, the long end, correspond to the colors red and orange. Green and yellow are somewhere in the middle. Remember the colors of the rainbow from elementary school? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or Roy G. Biv. That order is in decreasing wavelength. Red light has the longest wavelength, 
and violet light has the shortest wavelength. This is what I meant when I said that we as humans perceive wavelengths in the visible regime as color. For visible light, wavelength translates directly to color. Red for the longest wavelength, visible photons, and then getting shorter, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. From here we move to types of light with wavelengths just a bit shorter than visible light, ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet or UV range is somewhat narrow as well, although not as narrow as visible light. UV photons have wavelengths that vary from 400 nanometers, just on the other side of the visible range, to about 10 nanometers. This is just over one order of magnitude different, or about a factor of 10 from the shortest to the longest. Next are X-rays, which have wavelengths in the range 10 to 0 0.01 nanometers, three orders of magnitude. Gamma rays are the very shortest wavelength types of light, and they span from the end of the X-ray range, 0 0.01 nanometers, through to picometers, trillionths of a meter, and even down to femtometers, quadrillionths of a meter. A quadrillionth is 10 to the negative 15 meters, and 0 0.01 nanometers is 10 to the negative 11th meters. So this is about four orders of magnitude. The entire range of light is therefore from about 10 to the minus 15 meters to 10 to the 5 meters. The shortest gamma rays are 20 orders of magnitude or 10 million trillion times shorter than the longest radio waves. Despite this, all types of light operate on the same principle, oscillating electric and magnetic fields. They're all electromagnetic radiation. We've been talking about these times, types of light in terms of wavelength, but we could just as well have been discussing frequency. As you learned in the last lecture, wavelength and frequency are inversely related through the speed of light. One increases as the other decreases. A photon's wavelength and frequency always multiply together to equal the speed of light. As one increases, the other must necessarily decrease in order to always multiply together to equal a constant, the speed of light. This order of decreasing wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum is also therefore an order of increasing frequency. The gamma ray end has the highest frequency and radio light has the lowest frequency. Remember that we measure frequencies in hertz, which correspond to per seconds. For example, something with a frequency of 10 hertz happens 10 times per second. Something with a frequency of a million hertz happens a million times per second. If you're standing on a beach listening to ocean waves come in, the frequency with, with, with which they come in is how many times per second a wave arrives. For example, if, a wave ar if waves arrive 10 times per second, the frequency is 10 hertz. Light oscillates very fast. So even the longest wavelengths of light, those with the lowest frequencies, have frequencies that are fairly large when measured in hertz. Radio frequencies are generally quoted in thousands of hertz, kilohertz, millions of hertz, megahertz, or billions of hertz, gigahertz. The entire range of radio wavelength is about 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Again, eight orders of magnitude, just like their wavelengths. Infrared frequencies range from 300 gigahertz to about 400 terahertz, 400 trillion hertz. This means that infrared light waves oscillate 400 trillion times every second. Visible light again occupies a narrow range just 430 to 790 terahertz. 
the UV light range spans out to about 30 petahertz, 30 quadrillion hertz, and gamma rays have frequencies as high as several hundred zeta hertz, 10 to the 23rd hertz, or nearly a septillion, whatever that means. As you'll also recall from the last lecture, the energy of light is inversely proportional to the wavelength and directly proportional to the frequency. So energy increases in the same way that frequency does, from radio to gamma. I won't belabor this by running through all of the numbers exactly again, but they too span more than 20 orders of magnitude, just like wavelength and frequency. As a reminder, this means that the highest energy forms of light have 10 million trillion times more energy than the lowest energy forms. Let's put all three of these measurements together, wavelength, frequency, and energy. Radio waves are the longest wavelength, lowest frequency, and lowest energy kind of light. And gamma rays are the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, and highest energy kind of light. Because x-rays and gamma rays are high energy light, they tend to be given off by high energy astrophysical processes. And radio light tends to be given off by low energy processes. Because temperature is related to energy, it also tends to hold true that high temperature objects give off lots of high energy light and low temperature objects give off lots of low energy light, but we'll explore this more in subsequent lectures. So back to the different types of light. With the exception of gamma rays, you've probably heard of all of these before, although we don't often think of them all as light. In particular, most people think that radio waves are sound waves. Think about it though. If radio waves were sound waves, then why would you need an antenna to hear them? How would you only get one station at a time? Radio waves are actually very long wavelength light waves, and your radio is a light detector. It picks up the radio waves and turns them into an electronic signal that's fed to a coil that compresses the air in your speaker and creates sound. Each radio station broadcasts at a different frequency, which remember is related to the wavelength through the speed of light, and you tune your radio to pick up only signals with that particular fre frequency. Similarly, the x-rays that you're irradiated with at the dentist are the same as the light that you see with your eye, only shorter in wavelength, higher in frequency, and higher in energy. Notice again that visible light inhabits only a ver very narrow range of the full electromagnetic spectrum. This range happens to exactly correspond with the wavelengths where our sun gives off most of its light. As humans, we evolved to take advantage of the wavelengths of light where our sun is the brightest. If we lived around another sun, we might see in a completely different range of light we might have radio eyes or x-ray vision like Superman. There are some beings on Earth that have evolved differently from us as well. Most nocturnal animals see poorly in visible light because good visible light vision won't do them much good when the sun is below the horizon. Instead, their eyes are attuned to infrared light, which is emitted by warm objects such as their prey. In one of our labs during this unit, you'll learn about how bugs see. One important thing about these varieties of light is that they are not all created equal here on Earth. Not only does the sun give off different amounts of each type, lots of some and just a little of others, as we'll learn in this lesson, not all of these types of light make it easily through Earth's atmosphere. Here's a chart showing the opacity of the Earth's atmosphere according to wavelength. Opaque is the opposite of transparent, so atmospheric opacity is a measurement of how much light is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. A value of 100% means all blocked, completely opaque. 
and a value of 0% means all passes through, completely transparent. As you can see, the Earth's atmosphere is completely opaque to many types of light. Notice that this chart is opposite the last one, with the shortest wavelength forms of light on the left and the longest on the right. So it goes gamma rays, x-rays, UV, visible, infrared, radio, rather than the other way around. Gamma rays, x-rays, and most UV rays, though not all, are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere from reaching the ground. This turns out to be a very good thing. Think about it. When you get your teeth x-rayed at the dentist, you wear a lead apron and the technician leaves the room. This is because x-rays have both very high energies and wavelengths that closely correspond to the size of atoms in your body. If a cell in your body absorbs an x-ray just, light, just right, this very high energy light may mutate it, leading to problems with the cells such as cancer. Before you panic, you should know that the odds of this happening at the dentist are very, very small. Much smaller than poor health from tooth decay. So you shouldn't necessarily refuse your next set of x-rays. However, this is why the technician leaves the room. You only get x-rays at most every six months, but x-ray technicians operate the machines all day, every day. With that kind of exposure, the odds of one of their cells experiencing a mutation would be fairly high if they didn't leave the room each time. Gamma rays, x-rays, and UV can all be damaging to human cells in one way or another, which is why we're lucky that the Earth's atmosphere blocks them, and why you should wear sunscreen when you go outside. If the Earth's atmosphere was not opaque to high-energy light, the rate of mutation among living species on Earth would be much higher than it is. Moving towards longer wavelengths, the Earth's atmosphere is transparent for visible light and for some wavelengths in the infrared range. These ranges in which the Earth's atmosphere is transparent are called atmospheric windows. There's a large atmospheric window in the radio regime as well although the Earth's atmosphere becomes opaque again at the very longest radio wavelengths. This chart should tell you something about how we must do astronomy as well. Notice the telescopes drawn here. We can build telescopes on the ground that detect radio waves, visible light, and some infrared light. But if we want to detect high-energy, short-wavelength light, like UV, X-rays, and gamma rays, and if we want to detect the rest of the infrared, we have to send our telescopes to space. As an aside, even in the atmospheric windows, the Earth's atmosphere can have a blurring effect. So we actually send some visible light or optical telescopes to space as well, so that they're beyond the atmosphere and can take clearer pictures. It's worth taking a few minutes now to talk about telescopes as this is how we detect all of the different varieties of light we've been discussing here. A telescope is, in its most basic sense, a light bucket. It collects photons of light just like a bucket collects rainwater. The largest telescopes in the world these days are 8 meters across or a little more. Since we don't use meters much in the U.S., you might not have a great sense for how big this is, so let's change it to feet using a unit conversion. We'll use the conversion that there are 3.3 feet in one meter. So we'll make our conversion factor with meters on the bottom and feet on the top. The meters cancel, and we're left with 8 times 3.3, or 26.4 feet in total. Large telescopes today are 8 meters, or 26 feet across, or a little bit more. I said the main purpose of the telescope is to capture more light than you could with your eye. So let's compare the light gathering abilities of your eye and an 8 meter optical telescope. A telescope that collects roughly the same range of colors of light as your human eye would, if it were that big. So how big is your eye? 
According to Wikipedia, the dark adapted pupil can vary from 4 mm to 9 mm. For convenience, let's call it 8 mm. How does 8 mm compare to 8 meters? Well, we can go to our metric system prefixes here. Milli means 1,000th, so there are 1,000 millimeters in 1 meter. So 1,008 millimeter human pupils would fit across the diameter of an 8 meter telescope. 1,000 pupils to fit across the telescope. Of course, as you can see in this picture, this isn't the whole story because a telescope is two-dimensional. It has an area, not just a length, and a thousand human pupils don't fill up the area. So let's compare those. The area of the human pupil is pi times the radius squared, the radius being four millimeters, or half of the eight millimeter diameter. The area of the telescope is likewise pi, likewise pi times 4 meters squared. So how many pupils will fit inside of the area of a telescope? If we divide the area of the telescope, pi times 4 meters squared, by the area of the pupil, pi times 4 millimeters squared, we'll get the answer. Before you run to your calculator, though, notice that the pi's cancel so we don't have to remember what it is. Phew. The fours can actually cancel here too, and we're left with just one meter squared divided by one millimeter squared. Since the question that we're ultimately asking when we do this division is how many of these things on the bottom, human eyes, fit inside of the thing on the top, a big telescope, the answer should not have any units at all. So we need to get rid of the meters and the millimeters here. If we turn one into the other using a unit conversion to make the units on the top and the bottom the same, they'll cancel, and we'll be left with just a number, as we should be. The co conversion that matters here is that there are a thousand millimeters in one meter. Since meters are in the top now, I'll put them in the bottom in the conversion factor so that they'll cancel. Millimeters started in the bottom and are in the top of the conversion factor, so they'll cancel too. But not quite yet. Remember, we started with meters squared and millimeters squared, so we have to square this conversion factor too in order for it to work. If we square one meter, we get one meter squared. Easy. If we square a thousand millimeters, though, we get a thousand millimeters times a thousand millimeters. One million millimeters. So our real conversion is one million millimeters squared over one meter squared. There are one million square millimeters in one square meter. Now square meters and square meters cancel and we're just left with one million. It would take one million human eyes to equal the light gathering ability of today's largest telescopes, such as these, the twin 10 meter Keck telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Optical telescopes like these have two basic types of design. They can either be refracting or reflecting. All of the first telescopes, Galileo's for example, were refracting telescopes. They had lenses mounted at the end of their tubes that focused the light via refraction into an eyepiece at the end of the tube, which an observer can look through. For most of the history of the telescope, these were by far the easiest to make. Here, for example, is the 40 inch, just about one meter, Yerkes refracting telescope built in 1895 and still in operation today. Refracting telescopes fell out of favor once they started to get this big, though, because they have several problems. First, it's difficult to make a good lens any larger than one meter in size, so this puts an upper limit of one meter on the size of any refracting telescope you might build. 
Second, large lenses are very heavy, and they must be mounted at the end of the long tube of your telescope. Since your telescope points towards the sky and is controlled from the bottom, it becomes a bit like trying to tying a bowling ball to the end of a long stick and then trying to precisely control its location. It's hard to drive. The last problem with refracting telescopes is a phenomenon called chromatic aberration. The basic idea of chromatic aberration is that even within the narrow range of visible light, Lenses will bend different wavelengths, which remember correspond to colors, by different amounts, due, as you learned in the last lecture, to the varying speed of light inside of the material of the lens. So the focus for red light will be at a slightly different place than the blue. This makes for poorer quality images, since the focus for each different color of light is at a different place and it requires additional heavy lenses to correct. Reflecting telescopes, which operate based on reflection, as their name suggests, use mirrors rather than lenses. Mirrors focus light of all wavelengths at the same place, so chromatic aberration is not a problem. They are also generally mounted at the bottom of the telescope, so controlling their large weights is easier. For various reasons, it's also easier to make large mirrors than large lenses. If you'd like to learn more about how they're made in modern times, I recommend, I recommend touring the University of Arizona Mirror Lab, which is under the stadium and makes all of the world's largest monolithic, meaning single piece of glass, mirrors. It's well worth checking out. The reason people didn't build large reflecting telescopes earlier than the 1800s or so is that it's much easier to make a curved lens than a curved mirror. To mit mitigate this difficulty in making a highly curved mirror, reflecting telescopes often use multiple mirrors to focus the light, such as in the design shown here. Light comes in, bounces off of a large mirror called the primary mirror, and it begins to come to a focus. Before it does, it's intercepted by another mirror, called the secondary mirror, which sends it back toward the primary and continues to focus it. The light is sent through a hole in the primary, and the focus point ends up just below the telescope, which is where you put your camera or spectrograph. Speaking of cameras, there's another important aspect to the power of a modern telescope over the human eye. For many hundreds of years after its invention, Observers simply took advantage of the superior light-gathering ability of the telescope, which we learned, after all, could be up to a million times better than the human eye. When placed at the eyepiece, the telescope allows an observer's eye to act as though it were the size of the whole telescope, like blowing an 8mm eye up to the size of an 8 meter telescope. Beginning in the first half of the 20th century, it occurred to astronomers that they might use photographic technology to improve astronomical data collection. They began to paint glass plates with a light-sensitive emulsion and to place these behind the telescope instead of their eyes. The advantage here was primarily that the plates added a time dimension to the already superior light-gathering ability of the telescope. The human eye reads out, or sends an image to your brain, about once every tenth of a second. Then it throws away what it's collected and starts over. In other words, the images taken by your eye refresh ten times every second. If you could imagine suspending this readout and allowing your eye to collect light for seconds, minutes, or even hours, you would collect much, much more light before refreshing the image and you would be able to see much fainter things. Since the whole game in astronomy is usually trying to see faint things, this was a huge advancement to the field. Photographic plates were used well into the 1990s before being replaced by so-called so CCD cameras. CCD stands for Charge Coupled Device, 
and it basically works by creating a whole bunch of light buckets on the surface of the camera. Each time a photon, a particle of light, falls into one of these buckets, called pixels, it creates an electronic signal through a method called the photoelectric effect. The discovery of which, by the way, is what led to Albert Einstein winning his first of two Nobel Prizes. Digital cameras are CCDs and were in fact a spin-off of astronomical detectors. That's right, you have astronomy to thank for your digital camera. To understand the power of adding this time dimension to astronomical data collection, consider this image. This is a very famous picture called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. The director of the Hubble Space Telescope once had a crazy idea to point the telescope at a blank patch of sky and open the shutter of the camera for a very, very long time to see what would come out. He had no idea what he'd see. Since it was a crazy idea, he never would have been granted the time to do it if he'd proposed for it the way most astronomers have to. Most are unsuccessful, by the way. But as director, he was allowed his own discretionary time on the telescope, and he used a big chunk of it to take this image, which became very famous and will be the basis for an entire lab later in the semester. The total exposure time required to make this image, the open shutter time for the camera, was just under one million seconds. Remember how I said that the human eye reads out every tenth of a second? Well, if we divide 1 million seconds by 0 0.1 seconds, a tenth of a second, you get 10 million. This tells us that this exposure took 10 million times longer to collect than the images collected by your eye. It reveals the incredible power of an astronomical camera mounted to the back of a telescope. In summary, an optical telescope gives you an advantage in light gathering capability of as many as one million times that of the human eye. And adding a camera to your telescope gives you an additional factor of a thousand, million, or more, depending on your exposure time. You can see now why the telescope, and later the CCD camera, were so revolutionary in the history of astronomy. They allowed us to see things millions, billions, and trillions of times fainter than we could see before. I've been making an important generalization here, as we're so apt to do as humans. I've been assuming that you would be most interested in hearing about so-called optical telescopes, that is, those that are attuned to the same sorts of wavelengths that the human eye picks up. But let's give you more credit than that, because as you learned earlier in this lecture, there are a lot of other kinds of light out there, and the telescopes that collect them are correspondingly different. Let's start with telescopes for the long wavelength end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio telescopes are colossal things, mostly just because they have to be big in order to capture radio wavelengths, which are also big. It's lucky that the Earth's atmosphere is transparent at these wavelengths, because if we had to send these monstrosities to space, it would be prohibitively expensive. Here's the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope. That's right, 100 meters. A factor of 10 larger than the biggest optical telescope in diameter and 10 squared or 100 times their area. Whereas an optical telescope needs to be polished to be so smooth that the largest bumps of it on its surface are about one nanometer high, one billionth of a meter. Radio telescopes are designed to catch much bigger waves so small imperfections don't matter. If you're very important, such as the governor of West Virginia here, you might even be able to walk on the surface of a radio telescope without incurring the wrath of its designer. At the short wavelength end of the spectrum, telescopes are even more bizarre. If you tried to focus x-rays with a telescope that had the same curved shape as the optical or radio telescopes I've just shown you, the x-rays would just shoot right through it. Catching x-rays is a bit like catching bullets. The way to do it is to build a telescope with a bunch of nested, 
slightly inclined cylinders. X-rays come in, graze these cylinders, and are sent to the detector to be recorded. X-ray telescopes are always sent to space because, as we learned earlier, they don't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. This brings me to the end of the new material for this lecture, so let me summarize briefly. Today we learned that there are many other types of light in addition to what we see with our eyes, from long wavelength, low frequency, and low energy radio waves, all the way to short wavelength, high frequency, high energy gamma rays. The difference between the extremes of this range, called the electromagnetic spectrum, is 20 orders of magnitude. This means that the wavelengths, frequencies, and energies are 10 to the 20th power or 10 million trillion times bigger or smaller at one end than the other. We discussed the use of telescopes to collect these different kinds of light, starting with just why we use telescopes at all, for their superior light bucketness, their ability to gather way, way more light than the human eye, one million times more in the case of an 8 meter telescope. We also discussed the ability for astronomical cameras to add a time dimension to this superiority. By staying open longer than your eye can, astronomical cameras are able to see much, much fainter things than you can see with your eye. We ended by discussing two different types of designs for optical telescopes, reflecting and refracting, and basic designs for some non-optical telescopes as well radio, and gamma-ray telescopes. If you take only one thing away from this lecture, it should be a general sense that the universe is made up of objects that emit light of all varieties, most of which we can't see with our eyes. There's nothing special about visible light, just like the Earth doesn't occupy a special place in the solar system. We see as we do by a trick of fate and human evolution, and if we lived around another star, life and what we call visible light would be very different. As Maria will discuss in the next lecture, stars vary widely in temperature and correspondingly in the varieties of light that they emit. And it is by dissecting that light that comes from them that we discern their temperature and many other important physical properties.